Uh, I'm very honored to have this talk because for the last two years, I think your channel has been the main channel I have been occupied with on YouTube. Okay. Uh, and it all starts with one recording of an etude by Chopin that you put out. Which one? This was the C major one. Okay. And uh, that was the recording which, uh, how you say, provoked me. <laughs> and a lot of people get provoked by your research. So you know, and I'm, that was that was the one that provoked me. I'm not supposed to ask to ask the questions, but tell me, like you you went on YouTube, YouTube suggests that video, you yes. click on that, and just ex explain to me what happened then. Um, no, I I thought first I thought it resembled Bach a lot, Johann Sebastian Bach. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I violently refused it as an historical recording. Uh, but the, the the funny thing is that I looked at a lot of your other videos and I find found great pleasure in it because I love music and I love research. Uh, but that recording always it was always luring in the background as a sort of some sort of a proof that your theory was wrong. Okay, great. And, and this is this is the interesting part here, and that is what I would like to discuss with you about this. Uh, all the arguments against Holbit, but more, maybe more importantly, the reasons why one refuses to, to even attempt to embrace that theory. Because for me, it was that recording, and it was precisely because I had had a relationship to mm -hmm. that etude. Okay. And that's maybe central here. That, that you get you get a sort of a family, a bond to certain recordings, certain way of performing it. You have a relationship with the music you care about. You yes. Love. yes, that's true, yeah. yeah so. uh, and I liked it, but that recording became sort of the proof that your theory was wrong. But it's not the proof. It did, you know? because you rejected that, because it took away the impression you had of the relationship you had with that piece of music, like how it should resonate with you. Yeah. And so the acceptance, if, if I translate correct, what I hear you say is that you had troubles accepting that this was quote unquote authentic because that would take away maybe the permission even for you to like it as it's played today. Yeah, yeah. and it, it feels a little bit like you're breaking with someone. Yeah. It's almost like breaking with your father or breaking with your spouse or That's something like that. That's interesting the way you say that. So, yeah. so tell me the next step. Um, did that relationship with that kind of performance heal? So in other words... Because that's the interesting part. Eventually, precisely that recording would be the one that... Um, how should I put it? Eventually that recording would be what made me accept Holbit. Yeah. Um, I'm smiling because you're not the first telling me this. Yeah. Like I have several people and some of them we have <clears> of <throat> I have some uh, some people on WhatsApp on little groups, uh, young people, uh, um, uh, oftentimes musicologists. I mean, they are not present in the comment section, but they help me out with a lot of stuff like they're my critical eyes and things like that. But some of them really had the same history, like they came on my channel. They were actually very angry, <laughs> but slowly, like suddenly, like, yeah, this this musical paradise, as I call it revealed to them like in full power and then yeah they come on board and say hey I want to be part of this yeah yeah because with me it was it was like uh, I, I had gotten more and more into your theory but I had pushed that recording in the back yeah of my head and I didn't want to confront it yeah yeah I felt that that was your weak weak point um, but one day I decided to listen to it and it was fantastic and was it only that that etude, or because you probably listened to other pieces as well? Yeah, I listened to other pieces, and uh, I remember your your trio uh, by Beethoven for cello and clarinet and yeah. piano was uh, also very fantastic okay. because it, it there are many solo piano pieces and yeah and that's that's a limited experience after all. Uh, yeah. with the solo instrument but when that one came out i was really happy yeah. this it was, was, really was an exciting. important project for us as well eh? because uh, people would be saying like in the comments like yeah but wind instruments they would suffocate i mean there's no way that they could and yeah. then massimiliano came on board 
and he is uh, he was actually one of the first professional musicians i would say with a position because that's the point who's this uh, massimiliano miani who was a clarinet player of yeah, the yeah, trio yeah. Um, and he contacted me i i don't know with what year it must be in 2018 or 19 doesn't matter and he uh, sent an email he said yeah i need to talk with you just like that like very brief and we had a zoom call and he said listen you look very tired you work too hard you have to come over to italy i invite you to my house for one week and so we had a nice week there with my family and we decided to just record that uh, trio version which is a trio uh, transcription by beethoven himself of his septet and yeah for me that was like the first real collaboration even before alberto sana came uh, to just work with other musicians on this level and then this piece is so incredible because you have everything you have fast movements you have slow movements you have everything right. you have long notes you have ev everything is there but but that's the interesting part about that recording was that more than any other other of your videos i feel like the comment section were nicer in that video and precisely because it's not that much known piece by beethoven might be the case it's not that famous piece and therefore people haven't established a relationship to other recordings and then they hear it as if they hear it for the first time then yeah. it's like yes this is reasonable and then the opposite happened like what usually happens a lot of people who were there who heard it they've never heard the piece before they researched other recordings and they thought that sounded like circus music yeah afterwards but that is very common like i thought I've had this, this reaction quite a lot of people. For instance, there is one of the, my patrons. He has a huge CD collection. And every once in a while, he says, like, Wim, I have to accuse you for not making more records because you destroyed my entire collection. And of course, that's of course not <laughs> literally meant like that. Yeah. But what is true is that if you once are on the other side of the line, the whole beat line, I would say, and you just stay there for a while and you start to enjoy it a little bit, you don't realize that there is no yeah. way back. But yeah, because that's the, that's the thing I realized with this etude by Chopin. Uh, and that I've realized in relation to other things as well afterwards, uh, is that time is extremely relative. Uh, I mean, we've, we've all experienced it. We've experienced that one afternoon can go like this, or it can go really slow. Yeah. Like, so the experience of time is really relative like it's more relative than the difference between whole bit and single bit i would say yeah like a day can feel like eight times faster than another day and um, this is sort of the the paradigm when it comes to the whole bit single bit that you need to get over that line that yeah. expectation you need to, of, of just, how how fast it should be yeah to really hear how it sounds like well there are several aspects to it is one aspect of course in our modern way of playing and i think baroque music is getting there as well because we live in a time where baroque music is pushed like over the limits yeah because they're trying to make this impression that it was the rock of the time in a way yeah i honestly i don't know what what i mean even in hip uh, movements or ensembles i i would love to speak to the people what their theoretical explanation would be like why do they push like the brandenburg concert you will listen just to an old recording you had here playing why, why they would push that so fast like uh, beyond every, anything that is written in the 18th or 17th century concerning so, uh, only the tempo ordinario i mean even and i i mean i don't want to generalize when but when you talk to people um that should know because that's my point if you just go on stage and you say like listen i'm going to play bach or chopin or mozart as i like it there is nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that but if you are labeling your recordings as authentic performance practice like hip then you should be able not to give me all the details but to give your audience like the the guarantee you know Guys, I, re I researched everything I could before I came on stage and all the decision, major decisions of which tempo is, of course, one of the major. But what's yeah. the mo what more important decision can you make than your choice of tempo? That should be like rock solid written in stone why you take that tempo. And I can live with 10% faster or slower, but I cannot li live like, yeah, we play it fast because you don't feel the beats or you don't feel the pulses or it gets mm -hmm. boring. That's no explanation. Yeah. And for me, those performances, and it's very provocative what I say right now, they don't belong in this hip movement. No. They just 
belong to the mainstream where people's like, I just play the way I like it. And yep. that's fine. But please step aside and make make place for the people who do research because there are people who do that. Yeah. But and it feels like it feels like research is not even enough because it's it's something a matter of how do we live our lives and wh- how do we expect things to be because of how we live our lives. Like we move faster today than 100 years ago. You think so? Like Oh, oh, I think that's for sure. Like if we if we travel somewhere, we travel faster. Travel is not moving. Travel is not walking. No, but I think if you and I walk here uh, just uh, in this beautiful place where we are now, I can guarantee you that we walk in the same tempo as Beethoven. Yes, you have the same kind of legs. But what about the attention span? There have there have been uh, measurements of attention spans. It's a it's a big firm in America who has done research on attention span and even from the year 2000 until today. Yeah, yeah, we have the attention span the f- of a brainless person like today, like no, you could no, say. No, it's actually 8.25 seconds, I think it it's was the last. And that's lower than the goldfish. The goldfish yeah. has nine that's seconds on meant. average. Yeah, but that is a different <laughs> discussion because I think what you, what you, what you, uh, what I would say, like people scrolling on their phones and things like that, of course, that has an implication on your, on your brain, like dopamine and things like that, like you scroll on TikTok or whatever. Yeah. But that's also because the content is very boring. Like it's very addictive yep. because you expect the interesting thing to be in the next clip, you know? And, but that's something else. Like I'm totally convinced that our attention span when you play that music of these great people yes. in the right way. And right, I don't mean there is only one way to play, but I mean the, set the floor of the tempo. The tempo reconstruction is so important because when you change the tempo, you change everything. But that's, that's a little bit what uh, I mean, that when you give your full focus to something and when you have time but to the, sit the, down and the, listen, the, things feel faster. The things feel faster, but a lot more is happening. So the attention span of eight seconds might be very short, but maybe it's not so short after all. But those compositions, you will see that people are just sitting in a concert for one hour. I once had the experience, was very weird. I played the Clavacot concert it's, it's several years ago, I think 2016 or 17. I think even before I really seriously was was dealing with with whole beat. My, I play Beethoven sonatas on my clavichord, which already is provocative enough. And there was like a uh, like a setting in a beautiful chapel where hundred people, and I played three Beethoven sonatas on clavichord, which is on its own. Like I I don't think I would have the, the guts to do that anymore, but I, I did that. Okay. And first sonata went well, second sonata, then break, third sonata. I mean, we were listening one hour and 30 minutes to Beethoven sonatas on a clavichord. I mean, a clavichord is a beautiful instrument, but does not have the dynamic differences that the pianoforte can have. But it has something that draws people into the music. And they kept clapping. And so I played a fourth sonata. And they kept yeah. clapping. And so I played a fifth sonata. So we were there for, t- and then I stopped because, I mean, we were playing for two hours. And so if you tell me attention span is low, yes, but if the music is interesting enough, and I'm yeah. not saying that I didn't play well, I'll, I'll play it well. It's just the music was, people's attention yeah. is just still there. It's, it's, there. it's and, there. And I don't think that the attention span is like chronically low, but I think it's about expectations. And if you, if you really give it a go and you listen and you allow yourself to be but, dissolved but into the music. That's important. So you allow yourself to enjoy it. And yes. that's something I get a lot of as comments like, yeah, um, I like it the way you play, but obviously we, we know from musicians and from musicologists that it's not the historical way. So, and then the implication is I cannot give myself permission to like it. Yeah. And that crossing that line that we talked about, you have to give yourself, whether you are a musician or a music listener or a lover, you have to give yourself permission to one week dive yeah. into this as if it was not like a conspiracy theory, but really a reconstruction of what might have been the historical yes. truth. And then... There is no way back. Because that's the thing about allowing oneself. Because one thing I notice with a lot of musicians and a lot of recordings is that you can tell they want to go down in tempo often, but they feel an obligation to stay close to a single beat. And one example is uh, Schumann's Clavier concert in A minor, which very often opens in single beat. And then when the main theme comes, it slows down. Well, yeah. 
bum 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 and that's because they don't have a heart to play that as a circus melody but very quickly after that they feel like they have to increase the tempo again to reach the notation on the top of the manuscript yeah what can i say i mean beethoven's ninth symphony last movement same thing start like uh, very fast and then the baritone comes boom tempo drops to a whole bit and even yeah. below yeah. so Yes, because you are planning a recording on the ninth. Yeah, so we had the experience with the singers right now. So, but then people say, yeah, but it's a recitativo. Yeah, okay, but Beethoven marks where the orchestra, in our case, the piano has the the pre echo of the of the recitativo uh, as a recitativo, but in tempo, which yeah. means like don't change the tempo, which makes so much sense. Yes, and so, in whole bit that makes sense, but in single bit you have to change the tempo. Yeah, and, and, and between you and me, that movement in single beat is non-existent. Eh? I mean, it is ridiculously fast. So uh, Well, I, as Sander has a recording, which is pretty close. Like you have two metronome marks there. I mean, the pretty close is not close enough. I mean, you have to yeah. measure. And what you also have to do is not measure just the first. People sometimes say like the metronome mark is just for the first a few bars and then they yeah then you can do whatever you, you like yeah but often yeah. the problem is in the first few bars i mean how much levia sonata there the problem starts at the beginning right first the first jump i mean and yeah, things that's like, really inconvenient yeah so it doesn't make any sense and then you have to see what does someone like Xander does or gardner does over the entire movement where are the compromises because of course there are passages where you can speed up They're like the, yeah. the concerto you play you you mentioned and so this pressure of speeding up, like uh, you, you have to, it's not enough to say like, I play in that tempo. First, take your metronome and, and measure it. I, I, yeah. For the last movement of the ninth, you will be surprised. And then certainly if you, you, if you still keep to this, uh, the 96, which is the official uh, metronome mark for the last movement, which is a, a metronome mark, I doubt it is correct, but also as even a whole beat on the piano, I cannot play it. Okay, because that. it's really fast. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, because there are things happening inside there, which, and that's what you've mentioned, that sometimes it feels faster with whole bit. And that's something I've noticed, that when you slow down the tempo, there are things going on in the orchestra that you hear better, that doesn't just get swallowed, yeah. if you know what I mean. So you can hear da 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 and things going on. Yeah. And you can feel the rhythm and it actually feels faster. But that's, yeah. that's, that's one of the implications. So when people say like, yeah, this cannot be true because then music becomes so slow, it's boring. No, music can become much faster. In fact, what we are doing is, is reconstructing the fast Beethoven. It's yeah. because of all these impulses you get. And uh, we've now done all the symphonies. Nine, the ninth is, is about to be recorded with four singers. So that's an enormous privilege to be so close into the music and work so in depth. It's a piano transcription by Czerny, a phenomenal transcription. That's not the orchestral part, but yet yes. you are diving underneath the music surface you know and 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 have the luxury to to just practice it over several months and the discovery there is like unbelievable the level of polyphony in beethoven the level of harmonic power the way that he that he does the timings of everything it just makes sense and even in the case of the symphonies it's so well written that in the tempo that he indicated in whole beat, we don't have to do anything but just our job, make the right accents, make the right you know, decisions on, on how is our touch, what's the articulation, and all the rest is in the score. And then yeah. the music just comes by itself. And it's sometimes for us, Alberto and, and me, so powerful that during first rehearsals, we have to stop. Like there is too yeah. much going on. Like it's, it's unbelievable. But of course, if you speed up, what happens is, you get this impressionistic landscape where all the details just become like vague. Yeah. It, it's not paintings. structural anymore. It becomes more like a Ravel piece. Uh, but yeah, but but worse. I mean, the only thing in my, if, I mean, if you are on the other side of the line and I'm there like for years now, what what, what and you look back to to the to the to the modern performance. I don't call it single beat uh, performance because we don't have yeah. a single beat universe. Exactly, and that's that's a good hook here because I wanted to talk with you about the main argument against your theory. Um, it's not a theory. I have uh, to correct you on this. It's a praxis. It's, it's a practice. Yes. Yeah, you, it's a theory and a praxis. It's both for you. But for the single bit people, it's just a theory. You accept that one? Uh, it's not even a theory for the single bit people. I mean, it is like, for instance, uh, there is a study in 2016 done by Martin Norton. Um, yeah, he is 
today considered one of the, and, and rightfully so, I mean, the, the guy published or, or the graduated, as he got a, a doctoral uh, title based upon Beethoven's med, uh, tempo indications, 2016, there is not one word on the, on the work of Lorenz Guardian, like mm. uh, a book that was published a few years before. I mean, how... how he has criticized Czerny's metronome numbers, right? <sighs> No, he accepted uh, them, and that was the great Yeah, but he has, he has said that they are ridiculously fast on Bach, for example, hasn't he? So, yeah, that's another chapter on, on like, like uh, just to finish this, this, this first story, like, like, in that thesis, there is... What is so strange about this, these works, and I cannot blame people for doing that, and I should be a little bit careful of what I'm saying now, because, I mean, we all live in our own bubble, right? And, and, and it, sometimes there are mechanisms that you have to understand why people come to certain conclusions or why people refuse to start from another perspective. But his work is solely based on the acceptance of the single beat reading of the metronome as an a priori default position. We are mm. not going to touch this while, in, as a matter of fact, that is the thing you should research because the problems that are caused by these metronome marks from the past are exactly because of yeah. our reading and but they don't do that because there is a blind spot in like there is no alternative to this yeah. and so everything that they try to explain is built on this i would say that's a real dogma you accept something for which you don't have factual proof in practice and that's why i call whole beta practice and single yeah. beta theory there is no there is no uh, show yes. me the proof at the piano because at the end, that's what it matters. All and, the theory is like... But, but then you have the third practice, uh, or the second practice. So you have whole bit practice, you have single bit theory. And single bit theory is a little bit like a Jesus Christ figure that they're trying to reach. But the, you, have a th you have a second practice, and that is uh, the normal practice today, which to a very large degree is based on early recordings. And I remember that from when I had a Russian piano teacher. Uh, and I got very embarrassed because I was learning the Pathetic Sonata by Beethoven. And there you have a classical single beat problem in the opening. Because it's after the, the grave part. Yeah. And that transition, the problem there is that almost all pianists -da 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 they slow down there mm -hmm. before they... You yeah. know the part I'm talking about? It's in the grave still or in the allegro? Uh, it's before the allegro. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. But it's this part where you go up from... Yeah, yeah, you yeah, have a sort of a scale down. Yeah, yeah, okay. And when you get down there before you... Bum, bum, bum. You always slow down. Like, I haven't heard one recording with people who don't slow down. Okay. <clears throat> and I remember my piano teacher said to me when I played it for her. Oh, you listen to recordings. Because it says nowhere in the manuscript that you should slow down at the end of that. Yeah. I don't know if you can call it a scale or... Yeah. And I got really embarrassed because I, f I felt that that was wrong. Yeah. I don't know where that feeling came from. Uh, but I understood later that all pianists do that. They listen to early recordings and almost all professional pianists today, yeah. or, or even conductors, they based on early recordings. And very often there are things in the manuscript that they change yeah, yeah. because they adhere to early recordings. Yeah, yeah, it's like, and, and I would, I would, I would, uh, you know, cut out a part early. They listen to recordings. I mean, we don't listen to early recordings. Yeah. And that's a praxis. Like that's uh, something you listen to recordings and you listen to the examples of what has become accustomed. And often when people talk about single bit, they actually mean that kind of practice. Exactly. That means something else and just yeah. like adhering to a metronome mark. I mean, just as a start, I mean, there is nothing wrong. I mean, why wouldn't you listen to the great recordings to be inspired? Um, the only thing is that what people today, and I, I think both musicians and also music lovers like listeners, and maybe there's a little bit of critique from the hip movement, right or wrong, I don't know, rightfully or wrongfully, I don't know. But that what Polini does with Chopin or what uh, Brendel did with Beethoven must have been thoroughly researched. Like yeah. people really 
and I mean, you cannot blame the listener. If they listen to Brendel's Beethoven, they say, okay, but this guy really gives us an impression of Beethoven sounded. If they really would know that what actually was behind these recordings just do similar things that was taught to him and maybe yeah. having a little bit of another source, but there is not really something, the wish is not there to really go back 200 years in time, then that would be shocking no. to many people. Or, or just reading the manuscript and doing what it says there. Because one thing I realized very early when I played the piano was that there were a lot of things we didn't talk about. Oh yeah. But knew that we changed. And I remember very early I saw that the metronome numbers are faster than most recordings. And I thought, okay, that is sort of the culture that it yeah. should be l less fast. And I didn't think so much about I rem I had some conflict. Yeah. Um, I I played some Beethoven sonatas in single beat for a time, and then also which one did you manage to play in single beat? Uh, ask? Number nineteen, which is uh, nineteen opus number. Um, it's opus ten, I think. Okay. No, no, that's not possible. Um, it doesn't which matter. Opus, uh, I, I I don't know the numbers. Of, I I remember the sonatas. At least opus it's numbers. it's two uh, number nineteen and twenty. It's two sonatas that supposedly were prior to his first sonata. Okay. That yeah, he never yeah, yeah. published, but his brother published them. Opus thirteen, forty nine. Uh, mm. And they oh. are um, you yeah. have Those are one the, of them. The sonatas. Baram baram bam baram bam baram. It's a very surprising part of Brahm, yeah. that thing, yeah. which separates Beethoven from other contemporaries, I think, because most people would have gone down there, bum, bum, ba, da, dum, something like that. Yeah, I'd But that one is uh, perfectly possible in single beat. Uh, it's really wonderful in whole beat, though. You, you checked it in single beat, I guess. Oh, yes, I, okay. I performed it exactly in single beat. I remember that. Chern your Marshallist tempo. That I didn't check. But, yeah. uh, Anyways, um, what you say about the score is true. But if you start this this route, I mean, this is a weird, a weird kind of debate. Um, for instance, in our book that's going to be published next year, hopefully, uh, it will be like immensely thick, like seven and eight hundred. I have no, I have no idea even how we're going to get this published. But anyways, there is a section about in the first section of the book we talk about the problem. It's actually my section that I wrote like, there, there, the problem is real, there is no escape. I really want to nail the problem down because if we talk about music and music, mu music reconstruction and performance reconstruction, um, we only talk about what is an opinion. How do you think music is, is, is supposed to be played? And, and of course, there are many very, very good studies on ornamentation and on things like that. Mm. But the basis, of course, is tempo reconstruction. And if you read studies on, on, on that, like Clive Brown published things, like Barry Cooper even touched upon it, like Martin Norden, there is, um, except that one article on Czerny, which he published in 2013, but this, this kind of notion of there is a problem, really, uh, completely vanished with his doctoral yeah. thesis. And that is, of course, what we need to do. We need to bring, we need to define what is the problem that we're talking about. Do we have a problem? If the answer is no, in, in symposium, I would say, give me a piano and 200 scores and a metronome, and we're going to check. Because one metronome can be wrong, but 200 is no. And we can again go to yeah. 2000 if you want. And in the Sonatas by Beethoven, for instance, it's about three or four sonatas you can play in single bit. It depends uh, rest, on what player, it depends on what instrument. And that's yeah. also very funny that, you know... Uh, the rest people, of them you can't play in single bit. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we should make an overview of all the, the tempi given by Czerny. Czerny metronomized three or four times even the Beethoven mm. sonatas. Moshe gave, gave one, one uh, version. But anyways, there are, it's clear to everybody that uh, even Clive Brown, he, he, he noticed in his uh, introduction of the violin sonatas published by Berenreiter, I think 2020, so very recently, it's like, a, it's like 100 pages of introduction, where they talk about the metronome marks given by, by, uh, by Czerny and others. And then also they quote uh, Moscheles in the, uh, the, the footnote that is so interesting that uh, Moscheles uh, annotated Schindler's biography, so Bates Schindler, Beethoven's yep. friend and secretary, published 1840, the first biography of Beethoven was translated mm. in English and they asked Moscheles to annotate it. So we have the direct comment on, from Moscheles on Schindler, yeah. where Schindler is criticizing, not Moscheles in the biography, like this was this completely uh, crazy. 
But Marshallis um, defends his metronomization by saying like, listen, I even refrained from the current uh, practice where pianists take everything to, to a yeah. much faster speed. I even didn't give my own taste. I, I just made my metronomization of Beethoven and gave what I think Beethoven might have done. And by the way, my, my metronome marks are very close to those of Czerny, which is the real source. And then Clive Brown writes like, yeah, but how can you write something like that? Because Moshele's metronome marks are among the fastest, and he doesn't say among the most impossible ones, but they should do that. Why? Because if Clive Brown would say like, listen guys, Moshele's metronome marks don't make any, they don't make any sense. And yet Moshele says that he would play it even faster. Then we would have a clear three-dimensional yeah. picture of the problem. They're not only problematic in itself, but we have sources that they played faster than what we even consider to be highly problematic. And highly problematic in those studies means impossible, but they don't yes. write that. But we should have the courage to finally say, what, is there a problem? But the thing is, yeah, the, if you people say- Yeah, deny, people deny it. Yeah, but the thing is, if you say yes, then what's the solution? Yeah, exactly. And there is only two ways you can read the metronome. You take e for each take for the note value, or you do it like physicists today, like a pendulum. You take every two takes yeah. one. But there's a third way, which is the most common one, and that is ignore them. Uh, no, no, no. There's another way, and that is to view it as you know, like Italian view red traffic signals, like an option. But it is an option. Uh, yeah, yeah, but like, but like, not like, not like that. But like, I usually drive on red, but sometimes I stop. That is, that is the, the attitude many people today have towards metronome numbers, that they will always follow them. But sometimes when it gets a little bit too fast, they will go a little bit lower. It will be a sort of a comme ci, comme ça attitude towards it. Yeah, but uh, which, is, which is not serious. It's yeah, not a serious But it's attitude. also not correct because they might have the impression they follow them, but I can guarantee you that if you talk to 100 musicians yeah. of a professional level, only one of them will have checked. And a lot of them are updated, you know? A lot of them have newer metronome numbers that are a little bit slowed down from Marshallis and, uh, and Czerny. Well, yeah, if you have an Urtex edition, of course, you wouldn't have any, any metronome marks in because you, you would only have the metronome yeah. marks given by Beethoven. And it starts to change because Wiener Urtex also starts to give like, uh, in the cello sonatas, for instance, they published Czerny's metronome marks. And then also weird things like once you see it, you see it everywhere. The, 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 the person introducing that, I forgot his name, he says like, yeah, the metronome marks of Czerny, they are totally possible. You see, already they have given it a thought from the impossibility, but they want to, it's like yeah. being accused of impossible. No, no, they're totally possible, though they are faster than we would play today, with the exception of the Opus 5 number 2. That is mm. flat out impossible. And I, then I would say like, Czerny missed that one. Czerny yeah. missed just that one yeah, metronome yeah, mark. Yeah. And so the idea, but I cannot blame them. I mean, it's a blind spot. It's like we also for me, like for so many years, I was just thinking like this metronome marks. Okay, I had notion notion from my, my days in Amsterdam. My teacher, organ teacher, Zach van Oetmesse, he was uh, everything that I know, the foundation of that of tempo ordinario comes from him. I mean, I was set on the right direction, like understanding notation in the sense of if you have faster note values, the tempo slows down. You have what he called adagio notations, it was his invention, this term, but it's correct. When you have a piece in common time with 30 second notes as structural note values, yeah. you just slow the tempo down. By how much? That's, that's, that's to be seen. So everything, but I was skeptic, skeptic, skeptical to, to metronome marks in the sense of certainly slow movements. But, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you have to check and you have to work. And um, what you said about crossing, the, crossing the, 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 the red light, I mean, it causes accidents, right? Yes. But the point is not if you choose to do that. The point is what do you want to do in your life as a musician? If you want yeah. to reconstruct that intention of Beethoven or Chopin, I mean, why would you cross the red light once in a while? Why wouldn't you want to have a system that made sense? in which you said like, every day I wake up, I open yeah. my piano and I don't have to speculate about an exception because everything is just fine. But that, uh, that touches sort of the underlying, I, I wouldn't call it a motif because I don't think you have any other motifs than what you're open about, but a sort of a, sort of a accidental um, result of this, I think, is that your whole beat project sort of is trying to get back to where music was before where music was something that you could practice in your home 
uh, you could play together chamber music yeah. such because I think what has happened which is very clear the, the whole culture the whole infrastructure around classical music has changed for the past 200 years uh, so you have different infrastructures for example in the 1600s in Italy for painting it was church commissions you should make an altarpiece for mm -hmm. the church uh, in Holland of course with the, with the Calvinism this uh, became impossible and you began to make pictures for private people in their houses of everyday life in Holland, yeah. Amsterdam, people selling food, portraits, etc. And the question is, what kind of infrastructure did music have? And for a long time, it was for amateurs. Like Chopin's main production is music for young bourgeoisie girls who should play in their homes. Yeah. What has happened over the past century, I think, is that the classical music has become rebranded because you got CD players and everything. Of course, the speed happened earlier, and you've touched upon that with a new culture around concert houses and the bourgeoisie. But also that it became rebranded as not music you should participate in and enjoy and learn, but as some sort of a sport yeah. where the brand is these people does do something impossible. Yeah, yeah. So professionalism today, but we have always very, very nice sources in the 19th century. From, but today still, like, uh, the more notes you can play per second is equal with the more professional you are or the higher level, which is something, okay, that's a decision you take as a musical society. It was not the case in the 18th century. It was not yeah. the case in the early 19th century. But you have there the, dis the disconnect between the composer and the performer. performer like. Um, that's why the metronome was so important, like not only notation became more complex, like in the sense that like Beethoven said, we can no longer have the tempo ordinary, he writes in 1826. So yeah, the, met the metronome was, was, was really important for that because you had an absolute indication of the time or the tempo. Uh, yeah. But other than that, they also gave their metronome marks in the hope that others would follow them. And that, of course, is something that in 1815 nobody could predict that that would not happen, that you would have this new culture of what Adolf Marx would say, virtuosendom. And it was not in a positive way. There was just people who played like solely on stage, music yeah, by others. That's, that's funny because uh, my, the impression I have is that the word virtuos has a similar background as the worst word sophist in Greece because in, in, in ancient Athens you had these philosophers who walked around and brought up philosophical problems to people but after a while they became charlatans because because it wasn't an actual philosophical problem they were just luring people into corners mm -hmm. like like really yeah, yeah. making them look stupid and therefore you got this word sophist like wise guys it yeah, became yeah. A, some sort of a slang for oh he thinks he's a wise guy he's just yeah, yeah. making uh, uh, problems that don't exist with his words. Yeah. And that's a similar thing to the virtuos. Oh God, he's such a virtuos. Yeah, in a sense, you can have a very negative connotation, but also, of course, there is, there is merit in it itself. I mean, what happened in the 19th century from, certainly from 1840, I mean, the, the article of uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Fink, 1839, is so, is for me like a pivotal moment, that, like where he really burned down the generation of musicians around Berlin. Uh, I mean, Fink was a very important uh, chief editor of the Berliner Allgemeine Musicale Societum, where he say, you, you guys are murdering Mozart. And then comes the famous story with Tomacek Metronomax. Yeah. Yeah. But I it's mean, because basically what happens is that virtue is, is a very big word and it was a very important concept for Aristotle. It means to do the right things and to balance many things. That's what virtues means often, that you should balance the different um, mm -hmm. Um, and as a pianist, to be a virtuous pianist means a lot of things. It means to be able to play trills, it means uh, to be able to play according to what the composer wants. I never wanted. saw the connection between those two words, like virtuous no, and virtuoso. No, because that's, because that's the interesting. In music, a v virtuosity just means speed today. And technique, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's high it's yeah. speed and high technique, but not necessarily to perform it correctly and elegantly and these things, which probably it meant originally. Well, an expression. The, in the art article of Fink, I think he mentioned that it's so worthwhile reading because he also touches upon the reasons why people do that. And um, all the, he also even touches upon the new way of life. Like you, you, we, would, we have trains now, he said, well, you, you could even dream that you could fly. In a, I mean, yes, why not? Why couldn't we, wouldn't we fly in the future? But do you need to do that with music? 
And so what he accuses musicians of and conductors, he says, you know better than that, but you are educating a new audience that doesn't have the history of how this music should be played. And they're going to like actually what you're doing because they, 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 they forget about the right way of playing. Yeah. And also when you play that much faster, it's maybe not thinking the article, but we have other articles that say like, if you play that much faster, after a few times, it's very hard to go back to the slower interpretation because what happens is that when you go back to uh, the right slower interpretation, you have to at least listen to it once to recalibrate. Yes, yes. So recalibrate. What we are what we are trying to say is with this whole beat concept and this reconstruction of it, uh, and the whole book will just be one attempt first to make you see it, and secondly to just uh, reconstruct it theoretically. But in a way, it's like without that theory, if you just like look back on history. Does it make sense that today, after 200 years, after Beethoven's sonatas or Chopin's etudes, I mean, that would be 119 years, 90 years, that we, we still struggle to come there, what they had in mind and actually could do in a society that exploded in technical revolution? I mean, in Beethoven's time, they didn't build an Eiffel Tower, huh? They, they built oh. it much later, but like on 40 years it le went like this. But in the musicology standpoint today, the metronome marks in single beat prove that we as musical yeah. society went the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah. And, and Bach had no conservatory to go to. Yeah, but, I mean... Like he, had some, he had some teachers, probably teachers that he sought. But he, he didn't have a class he could go to and practice eight hours a day. The thing is, and of course, that's something I will never be able to write in a book or an article or use an argument. Uh, I'm in a way in a unique situation because I, I studied organ and piano at the same time. And I devoted much of my time later first to uh, study Chopin, but then really go with the clavichord back to the 18th century and slowly move on to Mozart, Beethoven again. So let's say for seven, eight years, I only played music from uh, Bach and a little bit before until young Beethoven and a bit. Yeah. Uh, and so when I now want to go much beyond that and people say, see, he cannot play faster. I would have to practice like a few years because your technique settles in a certain domain. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it, it is, and so the idea that you I need conservatories. I don't think that's true. I'm, I'm playing Schumann now. Uh, I'm learning Schumann's third sonata. And I think it's so much easier than Beethoven. <laughs> okay. And, and, and that's, and, and of course, I mean, I- You're not talking about the Hammerklavier sonata. No, I'm not talking about that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking about uh, some of his middle sonatas, uh, sonata yeah, yeah, number okay, nine and, okay, and okay, such. Yeah, no. uh, because, and, but that's maybe a personal issue. But the thing I wanted to say is if you, if you stick to this technique for like 10 years, and you want to level up again to the Rachmaninoff level, I would say yes. you would need five years. Like it's a completely different universe and you can see why conservatories were, were needed, why technical exercise was pu were published and what the 1830s and 1840s, what Karl Czerny did with the musical history. He changed everything. Yep. He was both the messenger from how it was in the past, but of course he created the Franz Liszt generation. Yeah. And so if you have that evolution till now, it makes so much sense. And now today we are reached, we reach a point where we say, okay, if we just try a little harder, we get there. We will never get there. I mean, mm. we cannot, we cannot play 15 to 20 notes a second. Our system is just not designed for that. But now I would like to go to something else. Uh, and that is the main arguments against whole bit. It's getting interesting right yes. now. Because just like you did with me, with that Chopin attitude, you have destroyed many relationships with your videos. Like there's a lot of videos on YouTube, people who are angry with you because you have killed their father or killed their son or sibling or daughter, whatever recording they have reacted to. I don't think they're angry with me. I don't, the people who reacted to most harsh on YouTube, <coughs> they see the logic but they want my permission to not see it. Yeah. And so they get indirectly angry at me for making them see what they actually should yes. have seen. From but, but something is something is provoked and they look for arguments against it and they have found arguments. And I would say... I'm interested for yeah, those arguments. One of, the, one of the most persuasive arguments in 
that I know about is uh, this document that I'm sure you're aware of by a certain Fafner. Oh yeah. Uh, with historical guy. timings where he goes through, I don't know where all his sources are, but he has different sources of different timings uh, that Mozart had this concert, Beethoven had this concert, and you have witnesses that it lasted this long and it does not correspond with Holbeat. For example, the, the concert lasted for one hour, 20 minutes, and in Holbeat it should have lasted two hours and such things. And that document has persuaded many people that the Holbeat theory is incorrect. So what, do, what is your best argument against that? I'm asking first a question to you. What is the main argument you take from that document and based on which details? I mean, we have to talk about details when we talk about yes. durations. Yes, and there's a lot of details in that document, but I don't remember those. But that's important. But, but the interesting thing about that document, as you know, is that that document does one big mistake. And that is that they, they mix up the difference between whole bit and single bit and the performances, because they don't necessarily align. And what he also writes in that document is that, yes, he has to admit that most performances that he has found sources on are somewhere in between. Exactly. And that's really interesting yeah. because that actually, that dis it disproves whole bit and single bit as historical performance. And then the question is, what we're left with, okay, so most recording in history, maybe they were in between. Then the question is, did they play too fast or too slow? And then you have to connect that to Do, the... Can, and then you yeah. can ask, can you find sources that composers thought people performed their music too slow, or can you do the opposite, find sources that they thought musicians played their music too fast? Can you give me sources of composers in the 19th century complaining about their music to be played too slow? No, exactly. So there's the answer. Yeah. And so that one passage in a footnote of Mr. Fafner, I think on page 76 or something like that should have been in the beginning because it's the conclusion of all. We, we are going to, uh, uh, I've made several videos on, on YouTube on this, so you can, you can, um, the problem with that document is it's, if you want to study data on duration, which is concert length, you have to make a very clear distinction between the data you're studying. And you also have to assess each and every data input that you're going to use. You cannot say we have this huge collection and all of it is fine. I mean, we don't know yeah. these playbills if they covered the program. That and, was and it also, sort of the premise of the document is that performance and metronome is the same. No, no, the premise of the document is to debunk Winter's theory. Uh, so no, no, that's the purpose, but the premise, I mean. Okay. Uh, the premise that he puts forth for his argument would be that the, the composer's wish and the performance is always the same. That is sort of a premise for it as an argument, but it's also something else. The premise is also that we have always performed music the way we do today. Yeah. That we perform, if we perform a symphony, that we perform all the movements. There but that's, that's not the case, is it? Well, we can, you can even see that if you go back to the early, early 20th century recordings, do we still play like that? Are we still playing like the, the performances that, uh, that, that we can listen to from, from musicians in the early 20th century? No, not necessarily. So why, where is the argument based off that we still, we don't play like them anymore, but we still play like people in the mid 19th century. It yes. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but I mean more this practice of just performing one movement, for instance, which was very common. So yeah, that's my point. With that on duration, you have to study the entire context. So. From those data that are really, you know, where you can say, this is something that I can take like, okay, four hours, the 1808 concert, that's one of the, yeah. more the main, main uh, data on, uh, on duration. You can say, okay, this Mr. Reichardt could have said like four hours, but maybe it was four hours, 10 minutes, three hours, 15 minutes, but let's take four hours. We do have the program of that evening. Now you're just talking about the specific concert. That's, yeah, just yeah. We going, we, you have to dive in each and every data because otherwise you cannot generalize. Many of the data presented in that document are actually not on the status of being taken seriously on a scientific no. level because we don't have the underlying um, uh, the specification of the event. But we have some idea, we do know that, for example, if, 
if in a small set in Europe they should put up an opera by Mozart, it was very common to cut away parts of it, but to fit it within a program. And, and also, as you have mentioned, it was common to play it faster because, and then what Mozart wanted because it was easier for the singers. Because the people in the countryside was not necessarily that yeah, that's well trained. Yeah, that's even another argument. Yeah, that that, that that's 1828 source that we have. Right, we say like uh, operas in the in the countryside was better because yeah, people have which sounds strange to people because breath. people would think that they would speed it up in the cities. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but the reason Things why they speed up is because they like bread. But anyways, yeah. like we we are already touching up on like so many different things that you should really calibrate yeah. the document with. Like what you say, performances in the nineteenth century. What was the culture? Did people play complete symphonies? Well, I've mentioned I think a lot of sources already in my eighteen oh eight Beethoven uh, video. Like no, there was yeah. no practice of of performing entire symphonies. Sonatas were even not played completely. Liszt combined mm. several movements of Beethoven sonatas, like until the 1839, Clara Schumann was the first time Clara Schumann played the Appassionata complete. So this whole idea that we can just go back with the time machine to the 19th century and we would sit sit like in like today today in yeah. Carnegie Hall, just silently waiting for the symphony for Beethoven to be played completely without any cuts, it's just not. True, and so only the data of George Smart are taking like a centerpiece in that document. Like here we have everything. Um, the, the article or the study that has been done to George Smart by Temperley, if you un analyze that article, the actual conclusion he makes is like we have no certainty about anything in what he really played because he said he makes a list of the problems and at the end he says the problem of the cuts and pieces is formidable. Uh, Smart only marks in two instances of all his data where, where he knows like how long the concerts lasted of the uh, yeah. symphonic society. Only in two places he said no cuts. What's the implication of only marking two cuts? I mean cuts means not cutting movements. Cuts means cuts mean cutting in a movement. Yes, yes. And so if you think about this and I can go in depth on the durations as long as you want me to go, but we need to go into each yeah. and every data. But if you think only it from this perspective, the question you have to ask yourself is this, what do you want to prove with that document? Yeah, yeah. Whereas you have the metronome. If you want to reconstruct the tempo of the composer, well, why not go to the metronome marks? And we don't go to the metronome marks no. because they have problems in single beat, but we don't mention that. And so the, the, the yeah, and that's what he writes. He writes somewhere on the page. This Hafner. I'm not suggesting that we should have a one three quarter beat or something. That's unbelievable. Because yeah. because most of the recordings are somewhere in the middle, as you know. But that's actually the solution then. And to my answer to that is yeah, like he's a in a way proposing that we should go over to one three quarter beat with that sentence. Then. What that sentence shows is the difficulty people have to really abandon the idea of the metronome marks, which are given by the composers, because that's a huge statement. Who is going to say today? I don't care about Beethoven's tempo indication. Who is going to say that? Nobody. But the implication is in the work. If Fafnil writes there like uh, one three quarter beat, I mean, what is that? Beethoven enters the door and he said to him like, he's sitting in Carnegie Hall, next symphony is from Beethoven. He said to him like, nice composition where we play it different, like your tempo really, come on. What do you think Beethoven would do? Like, it's fine. I'm so oh, glad I... you played my symphony. No. The, the, and the real question is, what do you want as a musician? Yeah. Do you really want to say to yourself every evening, if you look yourself in the mirror, I did a great job because I'm playing music as Beethoven wanted, knowing that you have to invent such theories to, to, to make it still fit. No, it's it. Yes. And why is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult to just go back and say like, let's, let's, put, let's clean the table with everything and let's start all over? Well, it's, it's difficult because it's such a big difference sometimes. But I mean, it, that... doesn't, it doesn't cost any money. Eh? No, but I mean, it, it, costs something, it costs something more. It costs people to change their mindsets. I mean, come on. If you have to repaint a painting, yes. I mean, that's, that's, that's time investment, that's money, that, yeah. that hurts because you have worked months on a painting yes. that you want to read. But we can just take our metronome and play in one minute a yeah. piece differently. I'm not so going to say that it works because that's what people don't seem not to understand how difficult it is to play. In. It's a new language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I 
personally, sometimes I think that whole bit is a lot more difficult than not single bit, but like um, the average recording. Uh, in my experience in Beethoven, uh, very often, if I if I imitate a famous recording, it becomes somewhat easier than whole bit because all the fast movements in my fingers sort of gets um, my fingers remember them more easily. You mean technically then? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. More like a memory thing. My fingers remember the movement because they reach a certain speed. Mm. Whilst in whole bit, very often, I have to use my brain all the time. And I have to read the music. It's more easy to remember well, that's if you That's a provocative statement, like, of that, course. This is my own experience. Yeah, yeah. I know what, what, you, what you say. Uh, b but playing faster is always easier. And everybody it's always knows easier. That. I mean, yes. mu in musical sense, because yeah. you have to deal with less problems. Yes. The pen pulses But you also remember faster. it more easily. So I remember at the time when I was just I was just imitating recordings before I found your channel. I, I could, saved I, your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I could imitate a piece by Chopin so quick, but now I really have to have the manuscript. Because when I reach a certain tempo, it just gets stuck in my fingers. I remember the piece. Mm -hmm. Now I have to read the notes all the time. Yeah. So in a way, you have made me addicted to the notes. Yeah. Well, I have to say, when, when, when people play like on, on a very high level, like, like uh, Polini, Lisica, you know, Schiff, they practice very slowly to really remember the notes. Because if you go beyond a certain threshold, that's what you do in conservatory as well. You, you have to practice slowly. What actually is very funny, oftentimes for them, that would be a whole beat tempo. So actually they're playing a lot in our tempo, but you need to really give the input, correct the input in order to make your motorical senses like uh, uh, perform when you, when you, because it's happened when you play so fast, you cannot just, you cannot think about everything anymore. You, you, no, no, it has, it, it, it just becomes sort of stained in there. Stained well, in your motorical senses should be very clean. On that high level, performing like this is extremely difficult in a way. I mean, I'd say musically it might be like a little bit easier because playing fast yeah. is always a little bit easy. I'm not saying that what they're doing is easy, but they have to practice so much to keep but this But it's difficult in something. another way. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and musically, it is more easier because you can hide behind just you, you hide behind the speed sim yeah and, and simple. not generalizing i mean someone like andra i mean come on these these are these are great musicians what they do within their but like for instance shift touching upon him he's, he's also known to play like not so fast eh, when he plays beethoven he's uh, really like or, someone Sch or schubert suddenly yeah. very slow but but that moves me into the next argument which is one of the main arguments perhaps. And this oh. is, and it is, it's less like the historical timing thing is an attempt to find an actual proof. It's at least an attempt, but this is more an emotion. And that is that people feel that it's too slow. Like I can just feel that it's wrong. Yeah. That's what they say. And, you know, moving back to my opening statement or my opening story with your Chopin etude, that is to a large degree about habit, isn't it? hundred percent. If I would have 1 million euro available and I would call to Andra Schiff and I would say like, listen, you get this 1 million on one condition that you play the 32 sonatas in whole beat, but in a way that you really captivate your audience would be done next month. Because that's what a musician do. We have a job to do, which is to perform a piece supposedly from the intention of the composer, but that's a choice. And I don't think everybody is really, uh, everybody thinks we are doing that, but I mean, a musician just, I can imagine you just practice and you, and you are in this course of life, but really like clearing the table and say, am I really going back in time? Am I really um, chasing that intention of the composer? But someone like Schiff, I have no, no, I mean, um, he could do that in an instant. And yes, maybe, maybe yeah. he would need one month to just adjust like uh, there are, because what the musician does is you have a, a musical piece, you have a score and the notes of course do not tell a story. They have the foundation of the story, they have the frequencies, but you have to match everything. And you, as a musician, you balance out all parameters and it's like always the same thing. You choose a tempo, but oftentimes musicians choose it like on the fly, they, they wait until something is in balance. And it's articulation, accentuation, and tempo. If you match those three in a balance, you have a strong performance. 
And the only thing I would ask with my 1 million euro is like I said, one of the parameters I give you and you stick to that. So what will happen is that these musicians on, on that level, they would find their other things to balance this and mm. to make a beautiful performance. Yeah. So yeah, uh, because you have to, uh, I so know, feeling you, have to you, have, you have to, uh, because first you have a metronome number and then you have to liberate yourself a little bit from it and allow some rubato no. and these things. Why? You don't think so? No, absolutely not. I mean, no, I, what, I, what I mean is that no, no, eventually what, when you what, perform, you mustn't think about the ticks. Absolutely. You must listen to in the music. That, in that style, 100%. And that is a way of liberating oneself, like mentally. And, yeah. But you don't, it is the same speed, but you don't think about the ticks when you perform it anymore. Absolutely not agree. You don't so, agree? No, no, no. This, this sense of tempo rubato we have today is absolutely later 19th century. It didn't exist. It didn't exist with Beethoven. Oh, no, no. I don't mean, I don't mean a Schiffer. romantic rubato. Yeah. Obviously not. But I mean that you So we practice, you, you for instance, listen to the, the Beethoven. Music. When we practice now in whole beat, we practice with the metronome ticking. Because yes. if you allow yourself to just... I mean, this is a system of 200 years ago, so we shouldn't give ourselves too much room because before we know it, we have also our habits. I mean, I'm 50 years old. I was 40 when I started with this, yeah. or 35. I mean, my colleague Albert is much younger, but he plays, plays piano since he was four or so. I mean, we all have our habits, so you have to practice like that. And then you will see that the level of rubato required is much less than you need. And of course, there is an evolution in that. Mm. But even Chopin, where today people just do whatever they want with the music. Chopin was a good friend of Charles Valentin Alcon. Alcon known for his steel sever, which means you play metronomically in time and you only slow down where it's indicated. So they were, and Chopin was part of that tradition as yes, well. Yes. Mendelssohn was known for his strict and rigid in time. You don't, so with Beethoven, it's more complex. But the idea, Chopin's rubato was so well uh, described by Liszt. He said, if you look at a tree and you see the leaves, you know, playing with the wind, that's Chopin's rubato, which means you have a steady tempo, but you do something in the margins. Yeah, and uh, I, I mean, that's my impression also of uh, Mozart's era also, that it was, um, it was very archaic in that sense, that it was not so much rubato and it was slower, but it was a lot of ornaments. No, if, if you see, a, if, you, if you're a composer and you, you have, what do you have in mind? I mean, obviously the music sounds in your, in your head, but you have a tempo in your mind. I mean, it's dictating everything. It's dictating the fastest notes you can use. But you, like, like for instance, the symphonies of Beethoven, they are a little bit different in composition style than the sonatas. The sonatas, certainly if you go to the later ones, they have like already this built in, necessity of what Czerny describes as tempo rubato, you go a little bit slower and a little bit, but he says clearly in his uh, street eyes, the audience should not even perceive this as a change of tempo. So mm. it's so little, but the symphonies, you can just practice with the metronome and it's not boring. If you give the right accents, everything you need to do is written within that framework. And I'm not saying we play like a metronome so strictly, but the tempo is very stable. Yeah, stable. yeah, yeah. I, just for the fifth symphony to give you like, like, like a little bit of a, of a behind the scenes story. We recorded that four times. First time was when Alberto came on board. Of course, it was a tryout. The recording on YouTube was for, still there. Then we recorded it the second time, much later, 2020, I think, early for a release on CD. So we were already in another way of practicing. Then we did it a third time because the tempo was not stable enough. And the third time, I was very pleased. And then he said, like, we need to do it again. I said, I'm not, I do not agree. I mean, this is real, I want to do it again, so why not? But I think it's a great recording. And he said, come, we listen to the fourth movement. We start the fourth movement, if I remember from, um, from memory, it's 88, I think, for half notes. So we play it. It's majestic. It's like unbelievable in character. Right? But then we came in the reprise or so, and we speed up like to 92. And you would say like, okay, wow, that's dogmatic. People would say, so you cannot imagine how much this music changes. Like it was not the same piece anymore. I'm not saying that okay. it was completely nonsense, but from 88 to 92. And I yeah. said like, you're right. I mean, this is, this is just, this is just, and so, but then you move into like a territory where 
you are so invested in it. So you hear the difference between 88 and 92. Oh, everybody would. You think so? Everybody would hear that. I, I, I should make a video on that. Or maybe... I think I know a few people. Actually, most people I know wouldn't hear a difference, I think. If, if I would give you the 88 version, like for 15 minutes to listen to, and then we have a coffee, and then you go to 92, you wouldn't recognize the piece. And of course, we are talking about details. If we would play a 92 in a concert, I wouldn't have sleepless nights. But on this recording, yeah. and that's what happens. And that go, takes me back to my teacher, Jacques van Oetmessen, who said he was always working with his metronome, always measuring tempo, not in the sense of like, this is historically correct, but there is one moment where things just hit, like they have this, this horizontal yeah. point. And if you change that a little bit, you change the character enormously. But the more when you hit this point where supposedly the composer was as well, their slight changes changes a lot. Yes. Even Czerny writes, writes it in his pianoforte school uh, when he talks about the metronome marks of Beethoven. He said the slightest deviation in time destroys the piece entirely. And people today say like, of course, Czerny was dogmatic. No, it is correct. We have seen it. Well, I mean, it's clearly that's dogmatic, but what's wrong with that? It's not dogmatic. What he means is you can play 92 for the last movement of the fifth symphony, but if Beethoven marks 88, 92 is different. The slightest difference yes. changes the character. That's what, for him, it was equal to destroy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for me, there was a, was a revealing moment, lack of clarity, like, okay. And I thank Alberto for that. We but did but that again. is the case with Beethoven, I guess. That it changes more character than, for example, Brahms. The way the music is written. Why would that be? That's just my impression that Brahms' music is softer and more uh, romantic and it, it, it is, you can allow bigger tempo changes without it changing the character. But I, I don't know, that's my impression. Brahms is, of course, um, if I would meet him, it's, I would say, where are your metronomes? marks? Because he didn't <laughs> give, all my, he didn't, I mean, so yeah. few. Um, but actually Brahms has used a lot today as to say, like, see, Metronome marks are not important because Brahms said, yeah, you play it in the morning different than in the afternoon. That can very well be. Um, but there is one letter, and we talked about it, but there's one letter to uh, Clara where Brahms, uh, she was metronomizing the works of Robert. Yeah, her husband, Schumann. Her husband, yeah, Schumann. And he, Brahms writes, I mean, stop doing that. You waste your time. It takes you one year to find the ideal tempo, one year, and then to to at the end, uh, you know, find out that nobody cares about what the tempo was that you yes. And I guess that was also Wagner's reason for uh, quitting with metronome numbers because <laughs> no one follows them anyways. He, uh, Wagner gave more metronome marks than Brahms. Eh? So, yes, uh, but he quit also. Uh, and list, same thing. Like, yeah. where are the metronome marks by list? You came in a time, I think, where what Brahms writes to Clara is, is should be like above the bets of everybody that's involved in this reconstruction idea, like really coming close to the intention of the composer, because Brahms cared so much about it that he would take one year to yeah. find the ideal tempo of a piece to then find out that nobody cares about it. So like, you know, know what? Exactly. So he just gave up. But that's another argument. And maybe he was fine with like when people play this music a little bit like this and like this. I mean, we are not the composer. The only thing that I can say is for Beethoven, it was problematic. Yeah, but didn't for Beethoven, it was probably more important than Brahms. I mean, Beethoven seems like a more but, and that's, quarreling figure. I mean, he said the only reason why my Ninth Symphony premiere was a success was because of the metronome yeah, numbers. Yeah, 1826. And that is, that is quite uh, an exaggeration. But you see, that's another study. What we are trying to study is what do these metronome marks that we have really meant? Yeah. What the implication is of it once we are there. We are not, as a musical society, already there. We are we're still in the phase of reconstructing them. And today, for 100 years, there is an attempt to reconstruct them in single beat. I would say that failed. If we, if we, like sometimes you hear, yeah, if musicians only wanted, they would have be, be able to, to, to do that. Okay, but in 100 years, we would have those recordings, mm -hmm. right? On period instruments. Mm -hmm. We don't have them. So we had the chance, we go to another way of, of, but then what the implication is, I mean, you, you can keep playing your pieces as you want then. Eh? Yes, and that's, it's another argument made from the other side, so to say. 
is that why care about metronome marks? Can't we just play it how we feel it and then we find the truth? Because uh, we, we somehow miraculously resonate our souls with Beethoven. Uh, exactly, and that is, that is the it's issue there. Years I, I, ago. I like that. I like to play and I sense how it should be played, but it's really naive to think that I can truly feel how the composers thought it would be. Like if, I, if I'm in a room and I attempt to perceive how people think and what mood they are in, I often fail. You know? So why would I be able to guess the mood Beethoven wants this piece to be in? Well, that's a choice. Um, I can tell you that you can play a great piece of music in a zillion ways. And I'm not going to condemn any attempt. But you have to make a choice. Of course, but there is... But in one way, there is a sort of... Um, there is... What is good about Beethoven's metronome numbers is that you can choose to play them perfectly like he wanted. But it also gives you an idea of where he wanted it. So if you just play it how you feel it, you might end up very wrong. Well, because wrong probably, is, yeah. prob you know, when people have feelings, this is what I feel. What usually they are saying is that this is how society today is. Because people very often confuse their own feelings with the society's feelings. And, oh, this is how I feel the Beethoven sonata should be. Oh, that's coincidental, because that's similar to all the recordings I've heard. Yeah. Like, that's a very big coincidence. But it's also so. true that people look for these anchor points. They want to have certain certainties. And the, the thing that can give them certainty are the metronome marks. But at the end, it's just a choice of people. I always compare, like, uh, once had a, a class, an Italian class, like, uh, and on, on, on Zoom, I had a conversation about a class of music, musicology, I think. don't remember. Anyways, there was one guy saying, like, listen, um, is it also not true that we, are live, we live in an evolved society? Like, actually, we might know better than Beethoven how to play his works. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's how many people think. Yeah. And my answer is like, okay, next day you are in a concert and Beethoven's next to you. Would you say that to him? Probably not. I hope so, because uh, that would be impressive. I didn't want to provoke this guy, but I just wanted to give him, like, and something to think about, because it's easy to say, we think about these figure as figures as abstract figures, like Beethoven. It's not even a human anymore. But yeah, he mm -hmm. cared about what he... It's your choice to do the same. And my next remark was, when you would see announced the concert played by Beethoven tomorrow, would you not go? And if you would go, why? You would like to find out how this guy played this yeah, concert. Yes. And so that's the only thing we try to do. It's one thing of that puzzle that we are just shifting of direction, which is the interpretation of the metronome marks. And I cannot help it that it changes so much. And I cannot help it that there's so much logic behind that. Yes, but do you know that they would throw Beethoven out of the concert hall very quickly? Because the, that's, that's how it is with these great figures who make this great work. They are so stubborn. And in Oslo at the end of the 1800s, sorry, beginning of the 1900s, Ibsen, he came back to Oslo from living abroad, Henrik Ibsen, from living abroad for almost 30 years. And he became involved in the theater place of his own pieces. And they had to throw him out in the end because everything should be exactly how yeah. he had written it down. And there was this woman who wanted to take away an umbrella because what is it with this umbrella? Why does he have to walk in with an umbrella, this one character? And then Henry Gibson said, that umbrella is everything. That's what all peace is about. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know with Beethoven. I mean, if you go back like into his time, the level of the performances must have been much lower technically than what we have today. We, we, we just overestimate that in, in any sense. What happened in, from the 19th century? For instance, you have this... I mean, even the, violin, even the violin strings were made out of intestines. Yeah. And so they were less accurate and more easily, um, how do you say it, false sound. But just look at Valentina Lezitsa's Beethoven performances. If I give her access to my Fritz piano for the, the, the instrument would be destroyed in five minutes. I mean, just compare the sizes of the hammerheads with, I mean, it's, it's, it's even to play that fast, to have that much energy, the Viennese pianos cannot absorb that. Yeah. So, and, and that's, I think that's the sort of the core thing about your project, practice, practice. It's all about the practice and it's practical arguments. 
Uh, in a way, yes. Of uh, course, we need this to. This is how what you can do with the piano, and also the counting. And that's so interesting. One and two and. Yeah. And the reason why you have that subdivision is because then you can keep a steady beat. Partly. And it's what you do when you count seconds in America. They say one Mississippi, two Mississippi, yeah. three Mississippi, because if you just say one, two, three, you fall out of the beat. Yeah. You need something in between there. And I mentioned this to my mother who comes from the folk music environment. And I remember that she said, yes, of course, that's how you count. One and two and three. Yeah, many people count still like that, dancers as well. In dancing, yes. Yeah. And that's when you come from the folk music, that's how you learn to count. Yeah. And it makes sense if and the book will go really in depth in the part of Lorenz the Guardian. I mean, there's hundreds of pages about this terminolog terminological reconstruction, but also the principle of defining, of measuring a tempo. When we go back to 1645 Mersenne, like how do you measure a tempo? It can only be done with two points. It's like in the old days, yes. you, have, you had a tuck, this is up and down. Is one unity represent the time of the semi brave it's the whole note. Yeah. And so you have touching up on the half note or the minims every time. It's described like that. One schlag exists out of two schläge. It's the same thing. And that's interesting because that's another argument against the whole beat that, persuas uh, that is very persuasive on the internet. This, this uh, text on how to use Meltzel's metronome. The Meltzel direction. Where it says where it says the two beats should not be counted as, as, one. as, yeah. as two beats. Each single beat should uh, from now on be counted as, as yeah, okay. And, and it's, I don't remember exactly how it is phrased, but it's something like you should not count it as two. And then they said, aha, it should not be counted as double beat. But it's actu so strange. But actually, it says the complete opposite, doesn't it? It it's, says the complete opposite. Yeah. But, I mean, because it, when you have tuck, tuck, don't count them as two. Yes, that's whole beat. Count them as one. So each single beat forms part of the intended time and not the two ticks together. And, they and not the two ticks together. Yeah. Yeah. And so each single beat between brackets tick. Already like we want to clarify that beat here means tick. But the origin, original like document in, is in German, isn't it? No, no, in English. It is in English. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah it's in English. There were German translations. So um, it's part of the intended time. So there are so many interesting things in that sentence alone. First off, if people say, I see single beat, is the document in 1816 is warning against? It's warning against whole beat. That's, that's okay, the idea there. Okay, so whole beat was the default position after all. Interesting, right. So, yes. okay, I can live with that. And then the text in 1816, what is the influence of that? But no, the text says each single beat or tick forms part of the intended time. Yeah. And then what is intended time? Part of the intended time, and then people translate it time by bar, and then we say no, that's not correct. You can go from time to bar, but that's yes. really not the obvious translation. In a text that is designed for making composers, you know, see how they have to use the metronome, how to use a metronome to indicate their tempo time. In the German translation, intended time, time is in, is translated as Zeitmaß, so it's part of the intended tempo. Yes. But what is the tempo? But, but, yeah, the, but let's, let's finish that. What yeah. is the tempo here? You answer the question. Yes. What is the intended time in this document? What are we talking about? Metronoma. Quarter note 60, for example. We'll be talking about metronoma. So yeah. each tick is part of the indicating metronoma. It's like yes. a textbook definition of whole beat. Yes. Uh, and but people see single beat and say, oh, we have single beat. Yeah, but okay. What? And, and well, the document is somewhat ambiguous, uh, at least for new, um, new ears and eyes. Yeah, it's yeah, like it, because it, 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 when you see videos of people saying should not be counted as two, aha, this is a single beat. But when you really read the text, you become more confused. What does it really mean? You know, that was my experience. You have to contextualize it. And yes. if you that, do that, then you see, okay, and it's like, okay, many musicians, I'm not trained as a scientist, I have to say that, but I know that if you want to solve a problem, you have two solutions that's so great in the metronome market. You only have two solutions. So you imagine that scientists, if they have to find a vaccine against COVID, like they say, okay, we have A and B, and that's it. They would be very happy. We have that situation. And so what happens when you have uh, uh, solution A? Uh, uh, projected on the text. Do we have inconsistencies? Yes or no? And then we go with B, single beat, whole beat. And 
what people do they mix everything they go like yes. it cannot be true because here and then we have there and then we no no you have to meet total and they have to have a met methodology and you go just okay and then in whole beat this whole text makes sense yeah. also where it says like it's common that a composer should that choose half note for an allegro and then later on it says like in it in, 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 in the case of a four for allegro the rod should take should indicate every quarter note yeah but wait a minute a sentence before you said half note for an allegro and then the tick should go into yeah, quarter yeah. note and then people say yeah, but that's a mistake because that's uh, that's the old way of counting you count the subdivision that's an that's an error and of so course, when you count seconds one and two you count half the seconds as well so you keep a steady seconds yeah but in this text from a single bit perspective you have to say okay that's is wrong that is a mistake by the out by the author. Yes, by the author of the Meltzer metronome. And I'm not saying that, that this text is like could be in the gross dictionary of music and musicians. It's not written for that purpose. No. They didn't have this this modern methodology to write really like step by step. So you have you have to work with texts who are a little bit ambiguous, you know? Yeah. But from a whole bit perspective that makes sense. And especially the last sentence that we are hunted with so much. It's a whole beat definition. It is. However, it, 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 the whole document is, it, it's quite evident that how to read the metronome, I mean, this conflict between whole bit and single bit at least, that that is something that they really didn't think about because they, they knew how to read it. But it's not explained very exactly. And then the, the question is, but that's a study on its own, I'm starting to think about it more and more. How many people actually had a metronome and implied these metronome marks? Probably uh, not so many. So we are talking about, and that's not. It's same. a little bit like the tulip fever in the Netherlands when people have researched the tulip fever. You've heard about it? No. No, it's the first economic bubble in history. And it's supposedly the whole market crashed in Amsterdam. And then you do the research and you realize, oh God, it was only 12 people involved. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that was only 12 people. Of course, it's this exploded in the No, but it century. might not have been more than 500 in Europe who had, at the beginning. Met, who had metronome at Beethoven's time. Yeah, perhaps. But of course, later, later on in the 19th century, this whole thing exploded with a lot of metronome marks that metronomes yeah. that also could take for 45 minutes and longer. And some of them not so precise as a Melzel patent, you know. So there is, there is so much to be studied. But the great thing is that if you just accept whole beat as a foundation and we, do, we would redo all the studies, but on all, every aspect, you would see new things instantly. Like now we look at that history and time from our perspective, from this, like I said in the Norton's thesis, like there is a kind of acceptance of single beat as a priori, you know, decision. Yeah. And if you look from all the, to all the sources, you have to, you know, selectively deal with that. And it gives it maybe a coherent impression. But if you go with whole beat from this yes. to, through the same documents, you will, you will get a much more coherent image but you will see so many more things that we might have just missed or not seen. I mean, we are just two guys doing this. Huh? But then there's the last issue, I think, which I, I don't think I've heard people talk about, but it's, it's there. And that is the whole bit's missing link. And I agree with you that from, from a very serious researcher's perspective, you have no, uh, no uh, solid, like super solid evidence for either. Like, uh, you don't have, like, this is the truth. Uh, but the only advantage single beat has over whole beat is that people have believed single beat to be the right way of reading it for 100 years at least. That's the only, until today, that's the only, like, thing it has going for it. And so, so therefore, the missing link in whole beat is when... And how did, did change? they change? Yeah, that is the missing link. And if I have understood you correctly, uh, the truth is that with the academies and the whole culture around performing, they performed faster and faster and faster, and they forgot about the metronome. Several composers quit using the metronome, and eventually, near the end of the 1800s, they became more occupied with maybe we should perform Beethoven in the right way again. And then they started reading the metronome numbers and what made most sense to them according to the speeds they usually played 
was single bit. Yeah. Is this correct that that is your it's impression? It's very well, well put forward. I, I don't agree that whole bit has no strong evidence. We have empirical evidence which is overwhelming, which are yes. the tens of thousands of metronome marks, combined to only sources of the 19th century that design or that describe a metronome mark to be an accurate and exact representation of the, of the, of the, of the tempo of the composer. We have not another source. When people say, I can quote, you can give pros and cons. No, no, there is not, I think, a single treatise in the 19th century that says a metronome mark is not an accurate representation of the no. exact tempo. I mean, that's, that's obvious because it says 82 and 54 exactly. and 126. If it was not accurate, why not just 130 and 80 and 50? So even in Czerny's Opus 299, 108, 400, 892, I mean, okay. So there is no discussion there. So there should be a, a, a reality check without any theoretical uh, explanation. There's a piano 200 scores we talked about at the metronome and just go ahead. But there is, there is a missing link. There is a missing link and you described it very well. If I go a little further in time, you, for instance, have, uh, and this is something that really needs to be researched, and I think it will be one of the most fascinating research. What we did is just putting on the table whole beat as the dominant metronome reading in the 19th century. But single beat goes way back, like 18, we have sources 1826 talking about a problem of metronomization. I can touch upon that if you want. Yeah, because if someone gets uh, a metronome for their birthday when in the 1820s, uh, they don't necessarily know how to, and let's say they have no musical background, they don't necessarily know how to count correctly, and maybe they will use single bit. The, the thing is that, so the, 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 the origin of single beat uh, metronomization is like for us around 1820 with the Novello editions uh, by, with, with sacred music by, by Haydn and Mozart. Um, and the description that Holmes, who was his major student, gave uh, why... And this is one person who used a single bit way of yeah. counting, right? Well, if you compare those metronome marks with the secular metronome marks, like for symphonies and others, then yeah, there is, there is a strong correlation one to two, of which some people say that church music is slower. Yeah, but we know that church music was slower, but not to a degree of one to two. And, from, yeah. um, and moreover, we have the explanation by Edward Holmes, 1826, who explained this way of metronomization, criticizing the way it was done until then, and it's very early on. So he says, like, you don't need a metronome to metronomize, to give a metronome mark. We keep the reference per minute because that's genius. That's a genius. Melville should yeah. have a statue for that. We would just count the number of notes we play in a minute. And then we mark like 66 quarter notes. That's, that's the definition of single beat. And then this goes on. The text is much more elaborate than that. Um, but then he says, like, yeah, even better would be durations. There we touch upon durations that admit that the composers even mark exactly that's the duration of my piece. And then he says, and that's important, yes. no musical idiot would try to play a piece in six minutes that's marked 12 minutes. And so how other can you explain that there was already in 1826 a lot of confusion in metronome marks? Mm -hmm. What other context can you give me but the confusion between whole beat and single beat, where musicians try to play a piece in six minutes that is actually meant to be played in 12 minutes, where Holmes criticizes the composers for not giving durations but metronome marks. Hmm. So he puts forward clearly the whole beat metronomization, well, but, that's also but read the single beat. So the confusion was there already in 1826. Yeah, but that's also because the, the function of metronome is not just the duration, but it's also to keep the beat when you when you play. yeah but it's not about the duration of the you, have, you, you should you should consider this you should think about it he says ideally the composer should not give a metronome mark ideally the composer should give a duration because yeah. in that way you avoid any confusion but of you, playing a piece yeah. in six minutes that was designed to be played in 12 minutes there okay. is no there is no other context but a whole beat metronome mark that already in 20, 1826 people tried to reach a single beat. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Oh, that's interesting. It's pivotal. Yeah. But yeah. if you go further to the early 20th century, there you have, for instance, the Rege Straube, Max Reger organist, Karl Straube, the great uh, organ composer, Karl Straube, the, his uh, preferred player of his premieres, of his massive organ pieces. Reger did the metronomization, and Straube did an, an edition with his metronome marks very close to each other on one condition. 
that one is whole beat and the other is single beat. So Reger marks his... So, so you have that difference in writing. So yeah. for instance, mm. just make this up, Reger gives half note 88, Straube gives quarter note 92. And like a whole series of metronome marks. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you come to a point answering your question and me saying like, this needs more study. These two figures lived together. They knew each other. They were friends. Reger sent notes to Straube how well he played the premiere of his piece, and yet the metronomization by Straube is half the tempo of Reger, for which he is destroyed today. Eh? People say Straube killed the legacy of Reger, and what they do, they try to match the tempo that Reger gave in whole beat as single beat. But there is, I mean, these people... But how did he destroy him? By making slower? By giving slower tempo suggestions, while actually they are the same. Yes, because he gave whole bit instructions. But at the same time. Yes. So can anyone give me a clarification why Reger didn't explode furiously like seeing that? Mm. But just there is no other explanation the, that they knew the difference. Yeah, but that's the thing, you know, going back to the, the whole bit practice, the one and two and three. And it seems to me that classical music and the metronome today is like the only area where you count like that. In physics? No, 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 I mean in single bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, because you count one and two in physics with the pendulum. You count like that in dancing, in singing, actually, is my impression. Is that... Uh, in practical life as well. When, when I made a video with my daughter on a swing, you know, how do you count it? And then people say, yeah, one, two, three. No, yeah, you, you didn't count, one, count two when she so was up in the air. It's one, two. Three. How do you count the wings of a bird? Do you say one, two, three of your one... To its, yeah. How do you count heartbeat? Sistola diastola. Bum, bum. Yeah. Bum, bum. Sistola diastola is very interesting, by yes. the way, but that's maybe, I mean... Yeah, so, so now we're touching on something very interesting. So really, it's only in classical music today that you count in single beat. No, because how does a conductor conduct? He, ca he counts one and... What yeah. does a conductor do before he gives a downbeat? Yeah, bum, he goes up. Yeah. Buff. This doesn't give a tempo, eh? So this you have yeah. and and everybody knows miraculously yeah, you follow the movement buff you know yeah. the tempo for the entire piece. So so even in conducting classical music you follow the whole bit of counting. But what I mean is that this twofold movement this, this, to define a tempo. It's that's only essential. in classical music that you have a theorization at least on counting single single bit. That might be true. I don't know. About no, but that. you know that yeah. is true. It's like their ideal that Beethoven's. Number nine should be counted quarter uh, quarter note 88, 88 in the beginning yeah. with each. Good luck with the 30 eight. second notes there. Yes, uh, no, I'm not going to attempt it. No, no, they, they, <laughs> they just sound like 16s, but anyways. Yeah, so, so actually the whole beat is the organic way of counting. Basically, and also like the, you mentioned with, with the birds and your heart and everything. Yeah, and also just the difference the nature of things. between the metronome as a Tight method, tact method, so and, and, and a device to give tempo, to define the tempo, and as a timekeeper, that's a different function. And that those two functions are mentioned in the 19th century as well. So there is a function, Melzel even talks about it in 1818, you have the, the metronome as, a, as an indicator of the time, and you can use it as to keep time, to learn to keep time, mm -hmm. to practice. And so that's, of course, yes, a that's, single that's bit the use. practical. That's the practical you, you, uh, difference. You, yeah, here. but in order to, to indicate the time, there's a twofold movement. There's up, down. And when we are down, we have the tempo. So the machine, like Fink even writes in, eight, in his book in 18, I don't know, the same thing that said, yeah, you murdered Mozart. He said, yeah, you need, you need two ticks to define the tempo. The note is defined as a second tick happens. It's twofold movement. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, even the police, when they take people for speeding, they measure the car in two places to get the speed, you know? Yeah, okay, the average, yeah, okay, yes. yeah. Oh, good to so know. So even the police are hole beaters, you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah. See, the implication of our research is unbelievable, even the police as, as being... <laughs> and one other thing about your research, which, which is often mentioned in school, but which I think people very often forget, is the significance of the... Subdivision. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the significance of, of uh, the, the, the Industrial Revolution, or at least that time period, how much changed. Yeah. And if you went back to Beethoven's time, 
how archaic the society really was. And yeah. they even, this is a Swedish author who talked about this. His name is um, Linkvist. He has made many history books about France and Sweden in the 1700s in particular. And he said that before the French Revolution, people spoke differently. Like we could go back in time to the 1920s, the 1840s, and we speak the same language. And I'm not talking about English and Norwegian, I'm talking about the way of speaking. We, we, today we speak in a very naturalist way. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to eat, do you want to eat with me? And let's play Beethoven together. It's very to the point. If you went back before the French Revolution, you spoke a different language. And this is evident in the plays by Shakespeare. It was metaphors all the time. Oh yeah. You know, and like Venus, I crown thee. And it was full of strange things. Yeah. And this is a change of the language, but why wouldn't the change be other places as well? And in, in music, for example, this idea that it's more archaic. It's Beethoven, but it's not the rock Beethoven. It's, it's slower and it's the, the whole mood is different. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, and also this idea of industrial expansion, we often forget that looking back to history in order to be able to reconstruct what was there is something very new. And when, when even you had students of students of students, for instance, from Chopin, of which you can trace back like very clearly that they didn't have the intention to keep the tradition alive, that just evolved. Mm. It was called progress of art, like it was something that was necessary. They, they destroyed, in our view, even organists like Tournemir, a student of Frank, he became organist of the famous Cavier Col organ in the Saint Clotilde in Paris. One of the first things he did was restore the organ, which was actually destroyed it. I mean, he took away the soul of what was originally there. Was, and then 30 years later was done again, like really electrified everything. So mm -hmm. the organ of César Frank is no longer there. And that's the tradition that we often today label as, you see, people were keeping the tradition alive. They were not. Then maybe to close, there's a famous or not famous, um, a quote by a student of, uh, of Liszt. What is his name? I, f I forget it now, but it doesn't matter. It was one of the later students of Liszt who wrote in 1814 or he gave an interview in the Etude, like a journal. And there, it, he was asked the question like, what would Liszt say if we would come back? And it's so interesting because there we have Liszt. You talked about like these living gods like Beethoven and Chopin and Liszt that we want to. And he said, um, like, okay, when I studied Liszt, I played this, this one piece, I think variations on, 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 on the Mozart opera, I think I forgot the title. I mean, uh, it's not so important either. But he said, like, it's one of the most difficult pieces of Liszt. When I came to his uh, place, he was amazed about the speed that I took. Oh, I thought that Liszt was outperforming everybody. So, and who he, was this? Oh, I need I need to look it up. I mean, it I, I, it should but be. But was this an historical story? He actually met Liszt. Yeah, yeah, he was a student. And of Liszt was just, shocked by the speed. Yeah. yeah, but then he goes on. He said, like, when Liszt would come back now, he would not even believe what he heard. And then he continues even. He said, when the students of Liszt. The students of Liszt would live now and would be wanting to enter conservatories, they would have to practice four times as much. And so this whole idea that at one hand the musical society declined in tempo and did not participate in this expansion already is there like debunked by this one quote, but also the figure list, like he was just part of this. He was mm. here probably one of the greatest musicians ever. But technically, this just kept on evolving. When Liszt would come back today, yeah. when Chopin would come back today, he would not survive the first round of the Chopin competition. I'm, that, and actually, yes. everybody agrees with that. That's but, the funny thing. But the technique evolved. But I think that what happens is when you always push yourself to reach those speed and reach that sort of bravura level where you should impress people, you don't get encouraged yourself to compose, I think. That's also because a change of culture. Because the further back you go in time, the more you find that performers and the change between composer and performers becomes less and less yeah. when you go back in time. And if you're just 100 years back in time, Paderewski, yeah. he, he composed a lot. Yeah, that's true. But today you have 
you have separated them. It's a, it's 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 a, it's like one of the, it's one of the things you can choose. Like I become a performing artist, and so it's my music. Or as the word goes, the performing monkey is an expression. If, so like I'm playing Beethoven instead of like I'm I'm Beethoven's servant. I want to discover what he had in mind, which will be impossible forever. But we can do one thing. The one thing we can reconstruct, we ignore today completely, which is the temporal reconstruction. And from there, you can start to build that entire universe. There are a zillion choices to make. So it's not like if we play all the same tempo, all the performances would look no. the same. It would be a like, complete diverse landscape. And that's our, our goal, like just to make people aware of like, we can do that. But we just have to, we have a, and that's a paradigm shift. But once you just turn your yeah. head, you see there's a reality behind yeah. your back. Yeah, I like what you said in the conversation with Janova that it's, it's for amateurs. That the music should be in for the, amateurs. In the authentic way of the yes. world. Which means a person who loves to do it. For Kenner und Liebhaber, as Emmanuel Bach writes, this, for, the, for the ones who knows music and for the amateurs. Meaning the highest level. Yes.